Kapala? There it is. I don't speak very loud, so this is really helpful. There we go. I think that's good. Happy Equinox. Day of Balance. I saw a poem this morning. It said, Equinox is the day, is the time when day and night bow to each other and the wind says change is coming. I thought that was cute. Uh, I think it's appropriate. I'm going to talk about uh, patience today and patience and balance are intimately linked. Introduction. Hello, my name is Matthew Cruz, Yeshe Chojer. Um, I studied Zen and then uh, met Lama and uh, started studying with him, took refuge with him in 2019. And uh, since I'm his student, this is uh, one of the things that we do. We practice trying to speak uh, Dharma. So thank you for the opportunity to give that a shot. Uh, little invocation. Om, um, reverence to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. I bow down and go for refuge to the feet of the excellent Holy Lama Yeshe Jimpa, who has great compassion. May the words I speak reflect this compassion and may my intention be a source of help and liberation to all sentient beings. Uh, so like I was saying that the talk is about patience. So to, to do a little roadmap for where patience comes up in the teachings, there's the three vehicles, the yanas. So first there's Hinayana, which is like the Pali Sutta, the Southeast Asian school, which is primarily about understanding suffering and working toward our own personal salvation, Nirvana. Um, that at some point kind of started to shift into Mahayana, which is generally considered the Northern school. And that began to place an emphasis on uh, helping other people become liberated, achieve Nirvana before ourselves even. So kind of the like, no, after you, no, after you school. Um, and uh, within that school is the, the idea that um, on the way to uh, omniscient, Buddhahood, one travels a bodhisattva path, becomes a, a hero of humanity, and that those heroes have uh, six important deeds that they perfect along that path to help other humans, or all sentient beings, excuse me. Um, and so those six are generosity, ethical conduct, patience, joyful effort, concentration, also called meditation, and wisdom. And um, and then the other yana is what we practice here, Vajrayana. They're like all inclusive in Vajrayana, meaning like we still practice the Hinayana and Mahayana path. Uh, Vajrayana includes Tantra. So with those additional um, helpful practices, they say like we can actually achieve Buddhahood in this lifetime to help all sentient beings. Um, so the resources I used for this talk are these books. The primary resource is The Six Professions by Geshe Sonam Rinchen, and this is a Vajrayana teacher. Um, like I said, I practice Zen, so there's a few Zen teachers that have a really uh, deep place in my heart, and one of them is Reb Anderson. And uh, so I used his book, Entering the Mind of the Buddha, Zen and the Six Heroic Practices of Bodhisattvas. Um, how, I would say this, the Six Professions by Geshe uh, Rinchen is like uh, extremely practical. Like it is just right to the point about how to practice, how to practice these, this conduct, these these six paramitas, perfections, heroic deeds. Uh, Reb is a really good storyteller. So that's really helpful. He kind of puts things in an analysis kind of way through his own lived experience, which I think is really helpful. And then the last one is the six perfections, Buddhism and the cultivation of character by Dale Wright. And he's a um, 
professor of East Asian studies at a liberal arts college down in LA. And his work is highly intellectual. So he he gives a lot of like historical background, etymology of the words used, um, and and gets into the parameters from that angle. And then he also offers a really interesting contemporary. So he'll look at it like the traditional Buddhist view. And he actually quotes Geshe Rinchen a lot. Um, and then he'll have a contemporary section where he um, presents it on a philosophical basis in modern times and like does analysis with Western thinkers of how they would approach a similar topic. Uh, so that's really interesting. I'm not going to, I really like to geek out on that. I'm not going to get into that stuff today, but um, those are those, the sources. So the meaning of patience as paramita um, in Sanskrit, the word used is santi, K S A N T I, santi, which means unaffected by or able to bear. And uh, as such, it can also be translated as tolerance, endurance, forbearance, strength of composure. So I think at this point, we can already see that the word patience is a little bit different than it's like usually used in normal everyday Western language, uh, where patience is probably a bit of just like being able to wait, just wait until something else happens. Um, and uh, Reb Anderson and uh, uh, Dale Wright, like, spend a lot of time explaining that that's not the patience of the perfection um, that uh, if we are simply trying to wait for pain suffering discomfort or a situation uh, an unjust situation to pass that actually we're trying to control the situation um, or at least and you know, and so that kind of confusing, like how, how if I'm just holding back, am I trying to control the situation, right? But when I reflected on it a little deeper, it's because, well, I don't, I don't want to be seen in negative ways, right? I want to be able to keep um, myself stainless, right? So if I just wait for the ruckus to die down and I don't participate at all, then I know like, right, like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm blamable. Right, and that's a way of controlling situations, right? I'm not involved, you can't blame me. But if we wanna be helpers, we have to be intimately involved with situations and other people with our suffering and with the suffering of others. Um, and so patience, Reb Anderson says very clearly, patience is not self-control, which again, that that really leaves me kind of confused about, well, then what is patience? Because when I'm being patient, I feel like I'm really using a lot of vigilance. You know, like most of the time, my personal brand is I'm like, don't say the thing, right? <laughs> Just don't. It's not funny. And they don't want to hear it right now. Like, don't say the thing. And it is a lot of self-control. So, so what is it that I'm trying to practice if it's not that thing? And he says that patience actually encourages us to be wholeheartedly with whatever comes and goes. So from there, so now hopefully we're a little intrigued thinking like, okay, well, what is it that I actually am gonna practice then when I practice patience and why would I bother doing that? Um, so we'll move on to intention. Um, and the Dalai Lama explains that the acceptance of suffering opens up two beneficial possibilities. First, that we will be able to think clearly about what can be done about the situation or the pain or suffering. And second, that we will prevent negative thoughts and emotions from taking a hold of us, meaning that we can avoid making matters worse by ruminating and wallowing in pointless feelings of regret and injustice. So I think here a couple interesting things kind of come up for me, which is 
yes, I can see through my life when I have spun out into being angry about an injustice towards me or regret about my own actions. How when I wallowed in that, nothing helpful was going on. In fact, I was probably um, creating habitual tendencies of mine that were unempowered. Um, at the same time, I know that I want to take uh, complete accountability for what I can and in my life, right? And so there's, I, I think there's there's some sort of balance there that you know needs to be internally felt or investigated. Um, I don't think that um, wallowing is taking accountability. Um, so a, a good story I heard, I think that captures this, the, the Dalai Lama told it, and he was saying that um, one of his tutors was imprisoned by the Chinese for over 20 years. And he finally was released. And so he came to India and he was living with the Dalai Lama. And uh, he said at one point in between um, things that they were doing they had a few minutes to relax and speak informally with each other and the Dalai Lama was asking him about his experiences being in prison and he was talking about how cruel the guards were and how they would beat them and starve them and say nasty things to him things like this and and he said so I had to be real careful so that it didn't get dangerous and the time I was like, right, like this guy's already in prison. He's already being beaten. He's already being spoken badly to. He's already being starved. Like, what do you mean? Uh, it might get dangerous. And his tutor said, well, I might start thinking negative thoughts about the guards. Right? Like, uh, so in this way, patience offers us the ability to protect not only others, around us and be able to be involved in creatively engaging with pain and suffering in a way that we haven't before. Normally we're going to do that in compulsive habitual ways, but it also protects our own internal world where we have a choice with how we regard reality, existence, and other beings. And that in turn protects us because what a, what a, an amazing inner world this monk must have had where he wouldn't even put his energy or attention on thinking negatively about someone who was abusing him to that level. Uh, so traditionally, there's three uh, situations that uh, require patience. The first is patience for those who inflict harm. The second is patience of willingly accepting adversity. And the third is patience in gaining certainty with the teachings. Um, so the first, patience with those who inflict harm. And the, the worry there, like we were just speaking about, is if we don't have that patience, we will become, we will have animosity. We will harbor animosity in our internal world. Um, so that patience allows us to remain calm when we feel anger, but not suppress the anger. So that's the trick, right? We're just, we're just kind of getting enough space between what we feel and how we respond to it. Um, uh, and so we want to do that because if we react, we create more harm, both in terms of our internal world and the people we lash out at. And it is also seen as the great protector of virtue, uh, meaning it is patience that keeps us from entering into unethical activities. I often like to say that um, unethical activities, uh, virtue, purity, the, the words that come up is I feel like uh, from what I've heard from people, those words are like really loaded when they're coming from um, certain religious backgrounds, and it can seem very oppressive and dogmatic. So I like to think about it like these things that are um, impure or um, virtuous or non-virtuous are things that harm myself or others. And, and that's the primary uh, guideline with ethics too. We do have 
some written out. It is a parameter to act ethically, um, but that would be part of it. It's like gaining some internal locus sense of um, uh, warmth and coldness and, and knowing where we're acting from. Uh, and this is my own little, uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but I did want to mention that Geshe Renshin does bring up that um, living a nonviolent life uh, does include nonviolence to water, air, earth, forest, the space of life. Um, what else? What else do we do when we're angry? Right, it's like really easy to think that people are separate than us. Yeah, I think I get that. So that's like the that's the what we call the the misperceived self, right? Who are we trying to protect when we're angry? Right, and generally, it's like some sense of um, who we are. I mean, I know in my experience, like, and I was in the military and stuff, but rarely have I been in a situation where I was like actually angry to protect this entity right like generally i've been angry because i'm like well i'm gonna look like a fool if i let them talk to me like this or um i'm gonna lose some situational power um or i'm gonna uh i feel like they're abandoning me so i'm gonna be really mad at them um or they're asking me to talk about something that I'm really vulnerable about that's really tender. So I'm going to be mad at them. Right. And when we look at it like that, we realize that like a lot of our anger comes from an ego basis. We're just trying to protect uh, the idea of who we think we are and the image we'd like others to believe that we are the image we would like to believe we are. Um, instead of, you know, maybe with that patience, there's an opportunity uh, to, to see our, our actions in a way that maybe someone else perceives them or in a way that's not justified. Um, and that's really, that's tough, you know? And so like Reb Anderson does a lot of like tricky wordplay, you know, he's always saying things, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Like he would say something like, you know, I, I had to be patient with the person confronting me with my behavior. And then I felt bad about what I had done because I saw it from their side. So I had to be patient with the fact that now I feel bad. Right. And then I wanted to like fix it. And I wanted to say something that would like make their pain go away. And I had to be patient with that. Right. And it's just like patience on patience on patience. Like there's all these different dimensions that we're actually living in. And at any one time, we only have so much bandwidth for what we put our awareness on. But the more we uh, practice this patience, the teachers are saying that actually our bandwidth really increases and increases. And, and there's more that we get to experience, which means that there's more opportunity to be there in a way that's actually helpful for others and ourselves. Um, there are also methods of dealing with this that you can do in meditation that are contemplative. Um, so for like, like thinking about if someone's angry at us and they're inflicting harm on us, um, to realize like, just like us, something got triggered in them, right? And that's happened to us too. So we can have some compassion for them. We understand that they're now triggered and that it's, it's like a demon is possessing them, right? Just like, I know, like for me, I've been so angry. It's like that I see red kind of thing, you know, I go off and I get done and I'm like, I'm not sure that mattered as much as I thought it did at that time, you know, but like once that, once those hormones and the things start going, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to come off of them. Right. 
so actually contemplating that that's what the this other person is actually going through too you know and engaging in that is not necessarily it's not going to be helpful if we try to calm them down or if we try to uh tell them why they're acting irrationally or you know there's all these methods like it's probably best to go away it's actually what Geshe Rishin said if you can get out of there get out of there just let them them do it you know and practice patience you know but really in the face of that like can you be patient and think have that right and that's why they recommend contemplating it in meditations is because then maybe in the heat of the moment it'll be you'll have access to that uh set of that set of logic traditionally there's like a lot of talk about karma and in that way we would see it as any anything that's happening in the buddha field um, is a result of our past karma so there's something there for us to purify you know we've done something in our past now and we can actually purify it through being patient and withstanding uh, someone else's anger against us and even in a very like mundane view, like, I mean, if the person's really mad at us, like probably did something, you know, I mean, maybe it was a misunderstanding or whatever, but like we did something. Uh, so a Kadampa saying is that uh, if we don't set up a target, there's nothing for the arrow to hit. Right. So that's also in the midst of this drama, in the midst of this anger, in the midst of others treating us poorly. If we're patient and we don't engage from these places of discontentment, anger, etc., et we won't make ourselves more of a target. Like we don't need to get sucked in to other people's dynamics. And so the patience is going to allow us to make a more creative choice on how to respond without getting sucked into that dynamic. And I think we have to be really honest about where we're at. And if we can't come up with anything, you know, that might, okay, more patience because not being very creative in this moment. So uh, any questions, uh, Susan? So what I think I'm getting from that, the definition of patience um, is acceptance of the way things are. Um, is that right? So um, acceptance of the way things are is talked about a lot in terms of the, the third situation. Uh, it, but I think always that's going to be an aspect of of practice. Like the, you know, one of the primary points is like, how do we uh, see through how we're misperceiving reality and begin to see it for what it is? And uh, I do think that that's a little bit um, of a shock sometimes, right? And so it, uh, seeing things as they actually are, oh. mm -hmm. you know, like, like accepting because impermanence, your, your right? Idea yeah. What is happening? Yeah. See things as they are, and yeah, that can be shocking. Right, because um, that's not the way, right? Like, there's this part of me that's like, well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Like, things are supposed to stay the same, so I can feel secure and stable. Now you're changing the game on me, right? So I think, yeah, coming to terms with some of these teachings is a bit of a shock. And I have another question. Yeah. Um, a little earlier, you were talking about, um, uh, let's say I hurt somebody with um, um, my words or actions. And then I discover, oh, wow, I did that. And this person feels bad. Um, I think you said you have to have patience when you want to fix it. You mm -hmm. need to have patience. And um, I'm trying to. Yeah, I, I think wrong. there might be a fix it. there might be a misunderstanding there. I was saying uh, patience, so we don't re uh, reach out in a way to fix, so we don't do that. 
Like, because we can't, well, we, I do think that there's possibilities to repair. Uh, I think the, if, I mean, this is like a subtle kind of semantic thing, um, but uh, fixing somebody, like fixing is generally, like when we talk about that, would, would be considered controlling the narrative getting them right as opposed to as opposed to accepting their humanity as it is the place they are on their journey and then if i've done something wrong repairing that like asking them like how can i how can i make this okay right that's what i would think we would want to do yes when you said to have patience i i guess i took it wrong mm. like don't do that or maybe be careful in how you do that is I think being careful on how we do things is really important. But you do want to um, remedy, I mean, apologize or whatever, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's that's okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing, isn't it? I, I think so. But um, like be careful how well, you do yeah. that. Yeah. I think that's what I'm getting. Don't be reactive in your response. <laughs> hmm. Like... Right now, uh, what I'm being patient with is, uh, can I articulate a way to meet a situation that's not prescriptive? Meaning, uh, yes, sometimes apologizing would be the, the right thing to do. I don't know if that would fit every situation, so I can't say to you what's right or wrong oh that was just an example where apology would be the right thing or it feels like the right thing to do um i was just curious about why being patient was inserted right there at that moment and now now that i'm thinking about it i'm thinking just be careful in how you react to that and how you approach trying to make that better or solve that problem is that right? <laughs> I would be I would be patient and I would also be patient with the feelings coming up in myself and like really looking at what are my motivations right now. Like I think in in terms of that particular example, I'd want to know um, am I uh, trying to appease this person? Do I am I actually sorry right now in this moment um am i trying to make it so that they're not mad at me right away am like i trying to get it not, right? right am i trying to get it to go away have i taken the time to be patient with their feelings am i really meeting them where they're at or am i doing like a self a self-service kind of thing like right like right now everybody's sorry about everything Right. If I walk into a store and I walk past somebody, they say sorry to me. I don't even, we didn't even touch, you know? So I think there's this, like a lot of times we're, we're reaching out to do the right thing in a non-authentic way because we haven't taken the time to be patient yet. So when I hear that, what I hear is um, patience is kind of the way it's applied in life. It's not being reactive. It's not going with your your initial gut instinct to make it better. It's um, holding back and being thoughtful and considering a variety of aspects that would be, that for most of us is not, doesn't feel natural, right? So it's, to me, what I'm hearing is just not being reactive, not going with your first instinct of a response. I do like the idea of not being reactive a lot. And it seems like that's what the Dalai Lama was getting at when he was saying uh, some of the benefits, the two main primary benefits of patience. But I still, there's something there where I think, um, I don't think we're trying to enter into a conceptual territory where necessarily the patience is providing us room to analyze things and come up with something that's best. That might be the case sometimes, but I think that it's more than just hesitating. If it was 
merely hesitation um, in an attempt to respond, I think it would be really easy to get back into controlling the situation, that it's self-control. I'm just I'm just putting the brace on, just pulling the reins in. And it's pretty clear that the teachers are saying, like, it's not that. It's something else. It, it seems actually very um, heart-centered, very relaxed, very peaceful. Um, and uh, yeah, a real practice of um, love. Can I add something? Do you think the sort of the conception of patience does help if we think about the other paramitas and sort of what those fuzzy boundaries are between all of them? Like what's the fuzzy boundary between ethical discipline and reaction, patience and reaction, meditation and reaction? Like all these have sort of a, a fuzzy boundary that you sort of have to learn. But if we just look at one in isolation, it's a little hard to see how that interplays with everything else. Do you think that? That's uh, talked about quite frequently, the interplay between the paramitas and they do work together. And um, so like we've discussed, I think a little bit, the connection between ethical conduct and uh, patients. And they are presented in the order they are for that reason. But uh, there's kind of an interesting connection between uh, patience and generosity, uh, which is uh, like being generous with time and space. You know, patience is a certain generosity to all things uh, in every moment. And uh and it and interestingly, right, it leads to joyful effort. So there's something something there about how we encounter giving space and awareness to all things that helps then uh, make us really want to participate in this thing. So I'm going to move on. Sorry. Um, just re Carrie, can you hold it? <laughs> um, so the, the second situation is patience of willingly accepting adversity. Um, and the danger if we're not willing, ready to willingly accept adversity is that we'll get discouraged on the path. We won't want to like keep going anymore. So we all know we're going to encounter adversity, pain, suffering, hostility, resistance uh, in our life. And so sitting in the middle of that discomfort uh, without grasping or turning away, and I think this is kind of going to get uh, to where um, hopefully elucidate a little more um, what, what you're questioning. Uh, without grasping or turning away is patience. So both uh, the physical experience of these situations are painful. So we're going to actually feel it in our bodies as pain, like, right? Like a broken heart is quite literal. It like actually hurts right here when things like that happen. And then we'll also notice that in association with the painful cessations in our body, we'll have certain thought patterns and emotional uh, experiences that arise. And usually where we'll want to go when something is painful is uh, stories that focus on regret of the past or how we could have done better if only. Uh, and we'll actually start planning into the future thinking that we can make a plan that will help us avoid any sort of suffering to come. And um, I think we all know from studying the Four Noble Truths that this is a um, futile effort and not the way um, to reduce pain levels um, because uh, suffering is a natural part of human existence. Um, but in the Buddhist approach, 
the idea is that when we wear that suffering as an adornment, um, it begins to change its nature. And so if we, okay, so they actually say like happiness isn't as good as you think. And what that means is like, if we try to make ourselves happy by creating a happy life, we're constantly going to be building sandcastles that get washed away. We're going to think like, oh, I, you know, I really like paddle boarding. So I'm going to get my paddle board. I'm going to go every week and then I'll be happy. But then like my back gets hurt or somebody asks me to do something on my paddle board day. Well, now I'm pissed off and I can't paddle board and stuff like this. Right. So my attempts at creating happiness will always fall short. And even when I get it, right. Then I'm going to be like, towards the end of the day, I'm going to be like, Oh, I don't get to do this tomorrow. Right. Like, Oh, it's over now. You know, can't wait till the next time. And then until the next time I go paddleboarding, I'm just like, can't wait, can't wait. My, my life's going to be good. Then this kind of sucks, but that'll be nice. So it's, it's a, it's a, a misperception on how we, we get, um, the life we want where actually when we start saying like, no, I'm just, I'm going to have some forbearance and sit in painful situations and in suffering, uh, it gives them the chance to transform. And when we put our thoughts on acting in a way so that others pain isn't intensified, that we can actually meet that person where they're at, actually be with them and their pain, their pain will, will diminish, will diminish. And this is having a meaningful life, right? So working for others, having a meaningful life. And this really interesting thing happens that uh, when we stop worrying about happiness and we start worrying about other people, all of a sudden we're like way more happier, way more happy. Um, so like Lama always says, um, you can, um, the goal isn't the fruit, but you can be really happy that you got it, right? You can enjoy the fruit, but that's not the goal. Um, another thing they say is, uh, Geshe Rinpoche says like, if you, if you get a sheep, you have to take care of a sheep. It's really traditional, right? Um, but like anything we get that we think is going to make us happy is actually a lot of problems and responsibility. Um, so it is when our concentration is on the transformation of suffering that we create the conditions for enduring happiness. Geshe Rinchen explains that true wisdom lies in willingly accepting the hardships involved in doing what is meaningful and of benefit to ourselves and others. Regarding suffering as happiness allows us the courage to meet situations in a creative way. And so courage is the actual antidote to anxiety. Um, yeah, we got time. Um, so always, right, patience is always sitting and suffering, being in the suffering of the situation without grasping, and that's what I meant by fixing, so I'm sorry, without grasping at it, trying to manipulate it, and without avoiding it, without turning away from it. Um, so let's do just a short meditation. The primary practice to get better at patience is shamatha meditation, right? So just single pointed concentration, keeping our minds balanced. If we notice that we're excitedly thinking, we'll slow our breath down a little bit, relax our body, come back to our breath. If we get a little like um, floaty thinking, magical thinking, you know, we know we're kind of falling asleep, it's laxity. So then we're going to Breathe a little faster, open our eyes a little bit more, come back to our breath. And it's actually, we're going to try to balance our mind. And in that balance is, is patience. 
And um, then there's this other aspect that we don't, it's much more talked about in the Zen tradition, which is don't move. Like once you take your position, like get comfy right now, I'm about to ring the bell, don't move. It's a short meditation, but just do not move, right? So you can practice patience that way because whatever comes up, whatever discomfort, thought, anything, our reaction is kind of, oh, we got all these like energetic ways of like getting away from it. But if we don't move, we have to learn how, what is it to be patient with whatever sensation, thought, emotion is coming up. Taking our Don't move, even if bugs were crawling in your hair. Or your eye began to itch. Hopefully there's an opportunity there to be patient with something. And uh, I, you know, the practice of meditation and like trying not to move is a, has been a really helpful way for me to learn tolerance and forbearance in a gentle way. Um, so that uh, right is like initially I could sit 
like a fascist. Like I could just hold very still for a long time, really tight, you know, and I would not move. And I, that's not the, that's not the patience that the ancestors are speaking of that type of rigidity. So I think there has to be some real level of um, attentiveness and love towards what arises for us to stay still. So the third situation is patience and gaining certainty with the teachings. If we don't have that, we won't end up embodying the teachings. It'll always just be an intellectual endeavor, which like, right, like we can talk about patience all day. The actual practice of patience is something completely different can't can't even actually say it right We're throwing all these words around to try to get what the actual experience is but i can't do it yeah um so we want to make sure to have a chance for the teachings to take a crack at us so that they can actually be a lived experience. And that means that we're going to have to have a lot of patience. It can take many, many, many years. Even for people living in monasteries, doing it full time, it can take many, many, many years until the, the teachings actually start to become an embodied way of existing and of relating to the world. And so that type of patience is you know, to make sure to be studying, to make sure to be doing the meditations that we're taught and to like throughout our day, actually be trying to uh, see, validate, like, is it, are things really impermanent? You know, is there really no self? Like, are things interdependent? Like, how is it, how is it working? Is karma true? Is cause and effect real? Like actually validating for ourselves. And the more we do that, actually, like, really have to listen to the teachings, really have to analyze what the heck is being said to me and then apply it. So is this true? Because the type of certainty we're looking for is not just based on belief. It's, it's based on because you, you really analyzed it, you really thought about it and then you've taken it to the streets and it's like, you're like, wow, it's really happening like this. Um, so that would be the relative aspect of sitting with the teachings, right? And having patience with the teachings, there's also an ultimate aspect. Um, and so that would be uh, the patience it takes to sit in emptiness. And in emptiness, nothing has inherent existence. There's nothing that exists by itself from its own side. And the more that is realized, the more it seems like we are in free fall because there's nothing to grasp onto. There's nothing there that is going to give us the lasting stability that we believe. And that's even the Dharma, because like if you've never noticed, it says, I will take refuge in these things until I'm enlightened. The enlightened folks are with emptiness, you know? Um, so that would take a lot of patience. I imagine it's a little bit unnerving from how it's described. Uh, Reb Anderson talks about transcendental patients like that with two different categories. One category is birth and death, and the other is with intimacy. So I'll do two poems, two short poems on birth and death that he provides to help us think about that. The one is a Han. This is on a Han in front of the Zendo. It's a big piece of block of wood that they pound on in a certain way. So all the monks know when they need to be at meditation. Like you get basically like a 15 minute warning, 10 minute warning like this. And it says on there, uh, great is the matter of birth and death. Impermanence is swift. Be mindful and awaken to this. Don't waste time. And then a poem by Saigyo, a monk. This leaky tumble down grass hut leaves opening for the moon. Now I gaze at it. 
All the while it was reflected in the teardrops fallen on my sleeve. Let's read them again. Poems take a second to sink in, you know. This leaky, tumble-down grass hut leaves opening for the moon. Now I gaze at it. All the while it was reflected in the teardrops fallen on my sleeve. Patience with intimacy, what Reb talks about is um, he was Suzuki Roshi's attendant while Suzuki Roshi was dying of cancer. He was a young man at the time, and he gives two different examples, one where he had to go on a long plane ride uh, with Suzuki Roshi, who was in incredible pain, and how difficult it was just to sit in the seat next to him, his teacher that he loved so much while his teacher was in pain. And there was nothing he could do about that pain. And Suzuki Roshi was um, a master, so he, he didn't need coddling. He didn't need entertainment, right? And so Reb really had to face just sitting there with the person he loved being in a great amount of pain for several hours right next to him with nowhere to go. And so that was, you know, being very intimate with him. Another thing he talked about was he had uh, gone and done some chanting teaching for a few months with some monks, and um, he came back, and his teacher invited him into his room again. He was still very sick. He was in a lot of pain, and he said, show me what you learned about chanting, and he describes this really intimate moment where his teacher was kind of like taking his face in his hands to adjust his lips and jaws and jaw to show him how to chant more effectively. And him being like, I wanted that level of intimacy with him so bad, but I also wanted to get the hell out of there. Like everything in me was like, whoa, way too close. You know, I love you way too much for this kind of like intense affection and help, you know, um, so much responsibility there too, to love someone that deeply. Um so sitting with that, somehow, according to Reb Anderson, sitting with emptiness. Um, so I'll close out with a uh, quote by Jade Tsongkhapa from the Stages of the Path. Patience is the finest adornment of the powerful, the best austerity to scourge the disturbing emotions. It is the Garuda, the snake of anger's enemy and a hard shield against the weapon of harsh language. Knowing this, grow accustomed in every way to the stout armor of supreme patience. And then um, the, other, the other day, Lama and I were talking and it was, it was getting really close. We were like really in it, you know, and we were kind of like going back and forth and it was getting like really deep. And like, I felt like we just got closer and closer. And it was just like, it was like this, like our nose, noses were almost touching, like talking about the way things are. And I was just so in it. And I said, teach me the secrets of patience. And he said, you're not ready yet. You'll have to wait. <laughs> Thank you. We'll do prayers now, or questions. Uh, it's up to you if you want to do questions or prayers and leave discussion for afterwards. No, we should do that before our prayers. Okay. Questions? Online questions? I think maybe we're doing that after. <laughs> so I don't okay. know. Is, is there anything okay. online you like? Thanks, Dirk. That means a lot coming from you. I was actually looking if you were online earlier because I was like, I really have to be careful what I say. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Thanks. Thanks. My pleasure. It's 
lovely to study and share. Yeah. Great dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha, Buddha and lead all, all living beings into that exception, into that enlightened state. state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Jatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness. May they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. O Lukiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Listen, Drapa, and make request at your holy feet. I don't know. Are there any announcements? Uh, we got one in the back. I've got a couple because I got the mic, so I get to go first. Um, so there's a couple sign-up sheets in the library um, for basically hosting meals with the monks from Nari Institute. They're going to be here at the end of October. Um, so if you're interested, you know, I can give you more information. Patty can help you out. Um, just sign up. Uh, and then, so for a while, I a while ago, I put an old bookcase of llamas in the library, and there's a bunch of kids' books on it. There are not many kids' books that are totally Dharma-related. So if you have any kids' books that are Dharma-related, that preferably are, uh, you know, this way, not this way, because the shelves are actually very small for some weird reason, that'd be great. You know, bring them in, put them in there, and then we just have little kids' libraries for, you know, the, the ones that are back there right now as they get older or any other kid who comes in. Um, so I'd appreciate help with that. And then I think... I think you guys know what my announcement is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dharma dudes after the it's kind of like the after party uh, where we get to talk about Matthew's talk I'd like to because it stirred up a lot for me so um, if you haven't been it's um, just open it's it's I know it sounds ex exclusionary but guys only <laughs> we've talked about why but um, yeah so come on back there's uh, some snacks and some things to drink so it's right after we're done here I think maybe last announcement is please help us keep the lights on and the heat on and the AC on and uh, practice some generosity if you have a moment too. Thanks. Omo araya pasaya na aindi. Om araya pasaya.